Nicole we said know it's Phil. Yeah, her daughter hit it. <laughs> this is what this is the side yard, and what I'm showing you right here. And uh, Cal asked me before, he said, where's the artesian well? All right, the, as you go down my side yard, you'll come to this little, what looks like a grove of trees. We've let the trees and brush grow up. It's a fish pond that the Washburns put in there. And it was fed by the artesian well. And it's uh, field stone and concrete. The artesian well fed it from the mill. The pipe that was there is in there. There you can see the, the field stone. We just throw brush in there. We don't want it to fill up. We always figured that some kid would drown in it. And so um, we'd have to... We just that's just brush and stuff of it. And I'm going. I thought I should have Towards the street? This is yeah. that's right by the bridge. Okay. And uh, uh, it's a pretty good sized pond and it's about that deep. Okay? Uh, it was uh, originally was fed by the artesian well which went uh, quit running when the gravel when the uh, stone quarry hit sixty five feet, it quit running. But it fills up, I wonder if it's gonna run again. I don't know. <laughs> but the pressure was released from the artesian well. There are four wells on the property. Um, there is a well in my, and I'll show you where it is in just a minute. Uh, there were wells to feed the livestock, which uh, was on the property at one time. The real problem with this is, is, is uh, Bill Grove at one time, that's the picture of my garage and part of the side yard. Um, and that's they where ran the river horse, would have been? Yeah, the river right would there. have run through here, yeah. see. And when that river flooded about eight years ago, you could see where it was supposed to go. You can't fool Mother Nature. <laughs> um, water was clear up to all, the edge of my driveway. Uh, it was a sizable pond. But anyway, that's the side yard, and that's the track, and that's why I showed it. That's the track of where the river came through originally, which would have left a great deal of property down on the other side of the river. <clears throat> From where I'm standing, and I think, now I'm going to move now. Anyway, that's, this is where the river is now, and I'm standing in where the old channel used to be. Um, there was this piece of piece right in here, in that piece of flat ground, um, Edson Murray told me that Dr. Washburn had grass tennis courts in there. Uh, the college didn't maintain them, and I sure as heck ain't going to. There's enough grass to mow there without having to maintain those, those courts. Now, I'm standing right now at the corner of the Gray Street Bridge, and that tree I'm zeroing on uh, is 400 yards away. All right, I'm just trying to give you some idea how long the property ends up getting. And the next shot I'll take will be from that tree on to back to the corner of the property. <coughs> the uh, property has about 200 walnuts, two to 300 walnut trees on it. And there you see, I forgot to shut the camera off as I walked. Uh, so I am not a professional. I do real good with 35 millimeters, but not very good at this stuff. Uh, we almost lost the film tonight. My wife couldn't come because she had another meeting, so she wanted to see it. And, and somehow hit the record button at one portion, but luckily it was at the end. There the house is fading out, but that's shooting up toward the main house uh, from the, low, from the, uh, the uh, center of what would have been the old river bed. I hope the other one comes out better. Now, it's faded out. I didn't notice that. I, mean, I was shooting from the shade, and the camera's eyes reacted. Now, where it's shooting back to now is the corner of the property, and I'm standing in the front. There's a huge old tree that sits back in here at the corner of, uh, of the property. One of these days, it's, it's going to come down. It's a big old cottonwood. It's, it's about two-thirds dead now. I don't know. I had, uh, a number of years ago, Ralph Bendig said, gee, it'd be nice if, if we could walk through those woods. Peg was alive. Remember that, Ralph? And so this is what I did. Now, they're all covered with leaves now, but I went through and cut paths through the woods. We let that uh, acre and a half or two acres grow up in, in heavy underbrush, as you see, raspberries, walnuts, all kinds of trees and bushes. And then we have these walk paths cut through there. Uh, Anita's been through there on yes, a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Every spring I clean it up and mow them and uh, people walk through the woods and the rabbits and the birds and, and the blasted squirrels are in there digging up my tulip bulbs. <laughs> I think the squirrels have eaten four or five thousand tulip bulbs over the years. 
the property, all the flower beds on the property I maintain, my wife does not. Everybody keeps saying, everybody said, nice. your wife's flower bed. Callum's ain't my wife's flower bed. So my wife does mowing. She doesn't do much of the flowers. She will have weed once in a while, but most of the flower beds are mine. But that's, uh, the woods is thick. There's a deer raises her fall on there every year, and then um, uh, that's another one of the paths. Bill Campbell told me there was a red fox out there the other morning. So oh, wow. Probably trying to catch some of the cats. I understand probably there's one cat. This is standing back by one of our gardens. And that on the right is Mexican bamboo, and there's a path that goes up through it. A number of years ago, Ralph planted some Mexican bamboo is to, to break the scenery behind the house. That stuff, just that, that's like planting a Canadian thistle. Boy, you can't kill it. It's real big. This is standing in the back side of my property looking at the back of the house. The deck which is on there right now, the roof uh, is the old porch which we left the roof. We covered up the original limestone steps and put on that deck. The porch was rotted and it had to be replaced so we just put the deck on but we did leave the steps in. Underneath that deck is one of the original wells. Uh, there's water at 27 feet. Uh, we could get water down to about 40 feet. Now, how much that would stay in there, I don't know, but it's sweet water, and uh, they didn't recommend that we uh, try confident, so it's just capped and sitting in there, but it does, there is water in the well. The other wells are right behind me from where I'm taking that picture. <coughs> when the college remodeled the house, and you can see the different colored brick, there were side windows on each one of those big windows, and the college still goes <coughs> in as an energy efficient. You can see where the break is in the limestone. The house is all brick and limestone. Um, we had all the windows covered in vinyl a few years ago. After you spend about $5,000 of time to have those guys, those cherry pickers, paint that trim, you probably decide to quit doing that. Yeah. And so uh, all the trim has been sealed now in vinyl. So that none of the wood is left except on the front, uh, on the front uh, little porch that uh, still has some that. Those windows are all replacement windows on the second floor. The original ones, the college kind of let rot out. The ones on the first floor are the original windows. Now, they have been stormed. Um, the ones on the top floor and the ones on the main floor. The one on the main floor is still original. The one on the bedroom floor, which the second floor isn't. The only wood is that, that little balcony up there. Now, that porch, which you'll see in just a second, was added, and I guess by the washboards, by the field stone. As you see, it's not on the original home wasn't there. It's a field stone porch. It was an open porch. The college then encased it and used it as a recreation room for their students. And it's all done with these field stone and brick. Those are the windows my wife just replaced. Variety of that. The, uh, the house, the, all, the, all the chimneys were taken off except the main one when the college redid it. And we've opened some of the fireplaces and we did put a metal uh, flue up there uh, hopefully, Mike Needham's going to put a new uh, chimney up this year to match the old chimney. That's the project for this year. Uh, he's also going to do the tech pointing again this year. The Needham's were the ones that did the courthouse. Mike's the one that does masonry work also. So he's going to work on that. Do you have interior pictures? In just a second. Because our time's running. <laughs> Time. Well, we'll <laughs> we can't fast forward. forward. Yeah, we can. We're we're there. Oh, oh, that's that family room. We put hardwood floors in it and turned it into a family room. It's not a porch anymore. Uh, the walls are all done in chevron pine. My wife didn't know I was doing this. She gave me, you know, I got a little lecture. That's the main stairway. That's oak paneling. It's original. That's where the field stone used to be, going up that side of the stairway. That was where the library was. <coughs> it turned out I should have more light in the house. I did this about 4.30 in the afternoon. Didn't come out very well. The uh, the next picture will be the, the fire one of the fireplaces we opened. We put a uh, a uh, oh let's see here. Oh, whoa yeah, whoa. Well, you want your window today? Yep. Um, it didn't come out very good. That stained glass window. The sun shining through it now. That was my wife and I's gift to each other. Now, you can't see the wood. That's all uh, white oak. It's been stripped. It took my wife six weeks by hand to do it. The stained glass is the same design as in my courtroom. Windows Dave Pitcher did it for us in 1983. 
and installed it. That's above the main window. And I'm sorry that the woodwork didn't come out. That's the fireplace that we opened up. Uh, the mantle on top of that fireplace is out of a, a farmhouse that we tore down in one of the farms down in Benton County. It was built in 1855. That's out of Loblolly Pine. That's damn hard stuff. It was, they've been marked for the pegs are still in that one. We just used it as a mantle. My oldest daughter on top, and those are those golf photographs that uh, most of you have been in my home have seen. I'm kind of proud of the way the girls play. That's the one that's got Annie and all the girls in it. I think, there we go. That's looking down the hallway on the second floor. It's our bedroom floor. We have five bedrooms up there. That's the French doors leading to our master bedroom. <coughs> I'm standing at the far end of the hallway. There's a stairway at both ends. That's the uh, uh, fireplace that we opened up. That's directly above the fireplace below. All the wood has been refinished. Uh, it's in its original state. And that happens to be poplar. It's not oak. All the windowsills up there were rotten. The college didn't take care of them, so they've all been replaced, and they're replaced with solid five quarter cherry that was cut out of St. Joe. Oh Dr. Ehler and I have made real good use of that cherry. That's, those, uh, the bottom floor is 13. These, are, these up here are 10. Um, those, those windows, when we replaced them, get real expensive because they're something like 95 inches tall or something. Yeah. Yeah. They're not fun to fool with. Fireplace was opened, and the man that opened is Cassini out of Lafayette. Uh, he did all the marble cutting. The cherry mantle uh, and trim was done by uh, uh, Dan, Dan. I'm thinking of him. Mr. Jones. I'm trying to think of his first name. Mm -hmm. Dan. Dan. Dan Jones. Yeah. Uh, and his wife, Chris. And that's done out of cherry that was cut out of St. Joe, and he, he did. It's really a beautiful piece of wood. That's when they told us these aren't wood-burning fireplaces. They're all charcoal burning <coughs> fireplaces. So that fire, my wife said, we'll open it up. You throw that birch in there, and I don't want you ever light it because there's not going to be any sparks on the carbon. So oh. That fireplace has never been lit. Um, it looks like it has been because that's because she faked it. But uh, it's open. You can light it. The flue's open. But, uh, it's yeah. been lit. but that's the master bedroom. covers the entire front of the house, and that's what it originally looked like as far as the size of it is concerned. The other five bedrooms are the result of the college chopping it up. Oh, well, let me say, are you about finished with the art? Come on. <coughs> well, that's the rest of the bedroom. Oh, yeah, this is what my wife cut off. She made me redo this tonight, except that she forgot to let the, the sink full of dishes. There was no kitchen in there, we bought it. Uh, that's our dining area. And you can see the bookcases now make up the thing. And that, Judy's my new purchase. That's my Frasier oh, that will trail the end very right. well. Um, that's a solid bronze paint, uh, solid bronze by Frasier. I got that at an auction last week. No kitchen anymore. Huh? No kitchen in there. That was the kitchen. I, I'm it sorry. I, I went by it. Let me show you. Well, it was a dorm. So they didn't there was have no a kitchen when we bought the property. Oh, okay. There was no kitchen. Uh, so we, we installed <clears throat> because the dormitory didn't have it. Right. So, so I. Kitchen or no. Uh, originally, the kitchen was here, is what Ralph told me. Uh, we put it in an island kitchen. And, uh, very functional. I love to cook, and this lets me cook clear out the center grass stove. And uh, that lets me cook all over. Yeah. Some, some free Columbia uh, so. One or two questions, because we've got to have a break. And I wondered real quickly about the um, bricks out by the sidewalk. Are those original, or do you have any history on those? Uh, okay. 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 I don't know who put them in. I didn't. Okay, we've got ten minutes for break, drinks, refreshments in the next room. Thank you. Please tell you one thing. All of our, all of our groups are going to be here on Thursday night, except for next week. And I hate to make you come out to St. Joe, but since we're going to talk about St. Joe, Drexel Hall, and the core building as of this old house connection, we want to invite you to be out at the core building, the new building on St. Joe's campus at 7 o'clock. We're going to be in the small auditorium. We'll have refreshments outside, and then we'll be in the big auditorium. So you're going to get to see the masterful <coughs> building that is created on that campus. 
So that will be the only one that will not be here. So please come. It's user friendly. There's a back parking lot. And don't be afraid to come out and see the structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ayler. He's been here before, too. <laughs> You're in for a rare treat tonight, yes. whether you know it or not. The discussion's already started. <laughs> <laughs> we have here with us tonight Perry Marlott and Earl, otherwise known as Bull Robinson, who are eminent experts on Rensselaer through the years. And we're going to talk with them tonight, and you're going to talk with them and ask them questions, things you always wanted to know, like, where was the original bakery? No, wait, not yet. <laughs> First of all, let me start the discussion by asking you uh, a general question. Has Main Street or Washington changed over the years? No. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> I, I knew the answer. Which is, yes. He's got pictures. Well, not many pictures. The genealogy group here in Rensselaer, isn't it? all four or five times that I was invited to. And then that, they started to talking about Main Street back in the early 20s. So we made a list of the stores and people that was on Washington Street, starting with um, Collins Street. Well, right. on, uh, just One way right across from the garage. McKeever Hotel. Oh, oh, that was an owl's house. It was a Democrat paper. I've only lived here 25 years, and all I knew was it was Republican. Well, <laughs> we asked Ed Kurtz to be here tonight, but he just right. had hip surgery. He couldn't I get down the stairs. I him to be here, and if I remember, man, there was a, a typesetter in there, I think, was a man named Kazan. Right, yeah. Yeah, Claude yeah. Kazan. Claude Kazan. Claude Kazan. That's right. Campbell also worked there. Bill. Bill Campbell. But that wolf bakery was right in the corner. Right in the corner of that thing. We walked to school. We stopped the first and stand around outside the door. And they'd hand you a donut. Here, take this donut and go on to school. They made that regular stop. Well, can I take over for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> well, starting at Kelton Street, down Washington Street, to the west, or, yeah, to the west, was McFarland's Grocery. And uh, I used to walk by where I live, and you get down to the uh, building uh, on the Front Street and Washington. The garage uh, building. So, but I come by my quarrels. The old gentleman was quite a gentleman. He liked to play checkers. So instead of sitting facing Washington, he faced Cullen. That was halfway back. So customers would come in, but the, he got the where he liked to play checkers better, so he was sitting there playing one day, customer come in, he said, you're fat and that's loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, then they had Haskell's Barber Shop, which is going west again. Then we had Bot, Bot's Telephone Service, and that was upstairs. Dr. Horton, the dentist, was upstairs. Ross Meat Market was next to them. Then Rhodes Hardware. And then to me, he, this gentleman was uh, the first uh, McDonald's. Shorty Dunlap's Hansen. 
If any of you would like to move up closer because you can't hear, please do. We talked, we thought about setting them right in the middle. Would that, would you like to do that? Would you like to do that? People are shaking their hands. Would you guys like to move right into the middle of the audience a little bit? Oh, you do around? Stand right up here just a bit. Let them sit around here. Well, now. Turn around. Oh, 
Well, they were starting to talk about 1920. Well, what about hotels? Did Rensselaer have any hotels? Yes. What kind of hotels did they have? We had two. Two of them. Holiday. Holiday movies. And it was on Tone Street. It was a block north of Main Street. Is that kind of where the old Hoosier Inn was? Is that no, no, the Charlie Moody, yes, that was the old Hoosier Inn. The old Hoosier Inn, that was one hotel, what was the other one? The McKeever House, right on the house. It's right across from Charlie Harvard. The Hardy. Hardy's restaurant was? How many floors? The Hardy's restaurant is now. Well, yeah, well. That's where the McKeever House used to be. How large was it? How large? I want to go back to the other gentleman, who gave the friend of Dean Yowell to the on the band for their people. It had three floors. I thought it meant three floors. Three floors. Van Rensselaer, genealogy. Rensselaer, Indiana was found to James Van Rensselaer, who came here about 1836 after he had lost his fortune in New York State. As far as I am getting traced, the family is Henry, later became Henry, born 1667 to 17. Murray, Captain Van Brew, their children. John married Angelica Livingston. John was a Lieutenant General of Albany, County of Militia, 1754 in New York State. Henry, 1712 to 1793, <coughs> married Elizabeth Van Brew in 1735. Killing married Harriet Schuyler in 1742. And he was a Colonel Fourth Regiment on the Albany County Militia in 1775. John Van Rensselaer, who married the Livingston of above their children. Catherine, 1734 to 1803, married Phil Schuyler. Second was Robert was a member of the Provincial Congress, 1775-1778, Colonel of the 8th Regiment, Albany County, New York, Militia. 1775-17, Brigadier General of the 2nd Brigade, Albany County, Militia. 1780-1811, Henry, Major 8th Regular Home in County, New York. The Tenneker, 8th Regular Home in County, 1780, a <coughs> state agent for procuring supplies under Governor Clinton in New York State, 1780. Lord Vandalin's litter, 1740 1802, married Cornelia Lutzen, Oliver Brigadier General of the Revolutionary Army. War serving from New York State. The general, Van Rensselaer, daughter of the American Revolution, chapter was named for him in 1896 as his son found in the town. The children, only one that I know of, uh, James Van Rensselaer was born in 1784 in Frederick, New York, married <coughs> Susan Delaney. Uh, um, in New York State, Marion Susan Blanton and died in Rensselaer, Indiana, March 12, 1847, buried in the Presbyterian Churchyard in Rensselaer, Indiana. The children, Susan Van Rensselaer, <coughs> Henry Weston, the baby son Henry Weston, was also buried in the <coughs> Presbyterian Churchyard. So, John Dalton Van Rensselaer, born in New York State, born about 1850, Cornelia Van Rensselaer. After the death of Jan James Van Rensselaer, the entire family went back to New York State. John Dalton Van Rensselaer wrote an article for the Rensselaer newspaper and was published July 2nd, 1885. Is that how we get some of our names like Colin? That's where we get some Weston, names. And Susan. Weston. And Weston. 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 
Ever since I was a boy, I've been told that John Street was named after my father. Sounds good. Where John Street? Well, tell me oh, more about this, this huh? Fendig oh, stuff. Street. Ralph no, Fendig no, had no, a no, drugstore. Yeah, That's the only drugstore right. I remember. Right. What, I what was, about... I was born right there at 301 Park Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> 301. We call that the Paul Robinson Shrine. I didn't tell you what our telephone number was back in those days. When you were born? 268 Red. 268 Red. Earl? Well... Tell me about, you were starting to talk about a while ago about the Forsyth building and you were talking about, well, and, and Perry was telling about that time there were we some were, other Fendig stores, but tell, tell me about the Fendigs in Rensselaer. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember? There's an expert here that's going to review place, what you say. We live over on Front Street, and I was in the middle of the night, I got a fire. And I walked barefoot in a nightgown. And my dad came up and got me out of the courthouse yard. They had fire in the four side of building. And that was a long time ago. It wasn't there, just this past year. Well, no, this was back when I was a little So there were two four site buildings, huh? Well, uh, no, and there were. You know, on the, on the corner of those buildings, it looked like an ice cream cone turned upside down. <laughs> and I, I was standing over in the, in the courthouse yard, and one of those dropped down. And you, whoop. Well, so it was that same building that was on fire. That's the same, that's the same building. And who was Forsyth? Forsyth on Blind Farm at one time. Which is <laughs> back in the 1800s, uh, out there at the North Airport. Then you come across there and you come down on that side of the street and then you come to uh, Forsyth building, which is the one that burned uh, this one, the one that the drugstore was in. Something else I can remember in the, in the back, not, not quite the alley in that fourth side alley. Dr. C. E. Johnson and Dr. Whiteford had also been there one time. Where were they? Back in the, in the late nineteen thirties. Yeah, late nineteen thirties they were there. When I was in high school. Now this is the Washburn C.E. John, uh, C. John Washburn. That was the one that owned Jeff McGrath's house. Yes, yeah, that's right. The Washburn owned it, and, and him and Johnson were his partners back in the, uh, your thing in the back of the Forsyth building right on the alley there. But the Fendigs weren't always in the Forsyth building, right? Oh, no. Well, it did not at that time. At that time. Ralph <coughs> Fendig was uh, the son of Ben Fendig. Ben Fendig was over in the left side of the bank. Just on this side. Next to the bank. The bank one is not what it is. 
You're on the way to Peoria. Mm -hmm. A truck. And they said they discovered the fire about 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. so it was probably burning when I went by. Mm -hmm. Well, they were in there Here cleaning. Mm -hmm. They were in there cleaning. Yeah. They cleaned them from the floors. Mm -hmm. well, I, I came back from Peoria in the afternoon. And she was gone. So those are the disaster historian points on Main Street. Well, you were telling me earlier about Herb Airwood's store and how that really wasn't built as a tire mark. <laughs> no, I've got pictures of that also. That was built. Don't get discouraged. <laughs> 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 Came here from Frankfurt, didn't it, Harry? Uh, well, he's been in the land. Yeah, when he came up here, but then originally he was in Frankfurt. Frankfurt, and that's where he was in. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about that building that Harvard is in now. And it's still standing, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> the building located up in Washington, now owned by Herbert R. Hood, was originally built by J. W. Duvall in the early 1880s. It was a three-story brick building with living quarters on the top floor, a farm and feed store, squatty store on the middle floor, and a livery stable on the ground floor. <laughs> It was occupied by J.W. Duvall family who ran the feed store and livery stable. Washington Street was a dirt road at this time was much lower than it is today. In 1905, the Iroquois River was dredged and a new channel was constructed. A new channel was struck. The Washington Street Bridge crossed. Bridge replaced a razor bridge and had to raise the street road to raise it. In 1910, the Rensselaer Garage Corporation was incorporated, who consisted of this corporation of 20 shares or value $100. Some of the owners were Granville Moody Jr., Bruce White, John Andrus, John Lapp, Max Kepner, R. E. Parkinson, Charles Moody. That was the one that had the uh, hotel down on the top of them. George Kissam and Dr. A. R. Kressler. These men started the first <coughs> in, in the year 1910. The Garage Corporation then lowered the second story about three feet to meet at about the same level as the Washington Street Road. The floor was then covered with concrete and was then used for office space and storage. A large elevator, elevator was installed in the back of the building to raise the cars to the top floor, which was to be used for service on the cars and trucks. <laughs> All of the rest of their garage shares were later purchased by, from the original owner by John W. Mallatt in 1911. He continued to operate the rest of garage as sole owner. On January 1st, 1927, he took in his son and partner, Sir Mallatt. He had worked with the him before. In 1931, they decided to remodel the garage to make it into a drive-in service station and garage. At this time, it was the second drive-in service station in Rensselaer. They changed the name of the business to Rensselaer Super Service. The business expanded wholesale into one of the largest wholesale cars in northern Indiana. They then named the business Merlite's Tire Market. In 1945, John Merlite passed away. Later in 1945, Herbert R. Hood Sr. came and joined the organization. 
1950, he became a partner of Terra things that we hear today is that Rensselaer doesn't have very many grocery stores, but over the years there used to be quite a few grocery stores here. Oh my God. Yeah, what, <laughs> what kind of grocery stores used to be here? I mean, I, somebody, uh, Boeing well, told me that one time Kroger had two different stores operating in Rensselaer. And P had two stores. had two stores in the same town. John Eager on Main Street. Right. Uh, a story about the old Hoosier Inn Hotel. I, my great grandmother was Emily Baker Long. Her brother Will um, Baker injured his leg. And Dr. Ira Washburn amputated his leg in the uh, Hoosier Inn Hotel before we had the hospital. <laughs> well, in, in 1930, during the county basketball tournament, I was a member of the Union basketball team at a two-room school out in the country. <laughs> and we played in the finals that night, played Rensselaer in the finals. We won the game in the afternoon. <coughs> and we stayed at the hotel uh, between the afternoon game and the evening game. And we won the county tournament. Depends on where you come from. It's who you are. <laughs> uh, Ken, um, gentlemen, uh, next to air cross here of the garage, which was upstairs, the <laughs> service department, and there is a chain drive truck. We'll pass that around. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, 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 Mr. Malad, across the street from. Um, where the tire market is, there's now a parking lot. <clears throat> but there are some exposed buildings <clears throat> off the alley. What what's what was those what were those used for? Who belonged to them? You know what I'm talking about? Where the building has moved, where the building has burned down next to TJ's and now there are exposed some brick buildings there on the alley. Were those businesses? Well, I think long ago, the warehouses, warehouses. The stores the, that were on. Wright's Wright. Furniture has yeah. this. W.J. Wright owned one. <coughs> the original Willis Wright. Go ahead. Barry, Barry, I think you have maybe one hotel out of or maybe two. Uh, I have some pictures back to the railroad track on the north side. I think Alex Chalmers is located there now. Uh, maybe you can get off the train. Went across to that hotel and they didn't take a uh, buggy or what uptown from the Keyword Hotel and stayed. And there was a restaurant down there. Maybe many people remember that restaurant there. 
that just not that attractive for Alice Chalmers is that. And then across from your place of business, isn't that correct? That was a hotel at one time? Right directly right across. No, no, no. That's where the wolf baker All right. That was a hotel over above, isn't that correct? What? That was a hotel? Yes. Yeah, all right. So this was a four hotel town. Keep talking, you don't mind. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, what are the city talking about is now? That's all filled in. That used to slope from the street to the river. Oh. And there's a man in a brick home that lived there named Ike Glazebrook. Yeah. And the zoo. Whoa. I remember. And his wife's name was Elvira. That parent used to call her my name, Elvira. Yes, uh, you're talking about the doctor, uh, Washburn, uh, cut the lady, uh, somebody's leg off, see. Okay, uh, when I was six years old, I had bad tonsils and I didn't go to school that, that year until I was seven. And uh, during about Christmas time in uh, the year I was six years old, they called Doc Wartburn out to my uh, my parents' house and he removed my tonsils on the kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I lived through it. <laughs> get my breath I started to turn blue and uh, when he got there he just laid me on the kitchen table and he removed my he took his fingers reached down my throat and pulled my tonsil right out of my mouth and, uh, on the kitchen table then he threw me in the back end of his bottle tea forward and took me to the hospital I did in the hospital for two weeks but my tonsils were removed on the kitchen table <laughs> he was a great surgeon he, he saved many many lives <laughs> Probably the greatest surgery rental I ever had. Yeah, sounds like it was Times have changed. I mean, we didn't hire somebody else. We had a kid out of school for a year. It wasn't feeling good. Now, if we don't get them well in 24 hours, there's all sorts of criticism. Well, we, we, on my list here of things that to talk about here is, is movie theaters. Now, <laughs> that, that's a current topic here in Rensselaer. I mean, tell me about movie theaters in this town. We had, back in the 20s, we had First Princess was on the uh, north side of the street. And right across the street, we had the uh, Oh, 
Council, Farmers Register, Trom, State Bank, Board of Remy, Riley Law Offices, Warden's Grocery, and Foresight Building. Now that's the one just burned here recently. Oh, uh, apparently what I read, down on the corner, of the, right on the, where the auto parts are, are the uh, auto parts are now on the corner where the big frame building. Yeah. And Willis Harris, a man named Luis, had a creamery in there. No way. There's no building in there anymore. It works for the, right on the corner of that parking lot. Where Napa is. Where Napa is. And one day this part, Mr. Harris went over and had a creamy over to mm -hmm. over where the grocery Jenny. store is now. No, he went over to where Denny Rusk is first, and he moved from there across the mm -hmm. or, or Hoover house is. Mm -hmm. okay. My dad used to haul butter in the South Water Market in Chicago when they had the creamy. And they made a truck out of an old Dodge car. <laughs> and they pedaled butter put up in the pound. They had two makes of butter. I think it was Hoosier made and Gilded Edge, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. There were different colored cartons. Mm -hmm. And we pedal that butter in different directions, places on the way in Chicago. They come around and say, well, the Gilded Edge doesn't sell very well, but. So we got the truck and changed the cartons. <laughs> 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 Harry Randall had an ice cream 
I want to throw it open to questions from the audience. What do you want to talk about? Ask some questions. Ask each other questions. Uh, who built, who was doing the buildings of these buildings? Who was doing the construction? How many, did you have construction companies or everybody building, <laughs> families got together? With? My day. No, they had. Uh, I think the one on our place, but they had architect here and everything. Well, it wasn't Mr. Cohen. Uh, wasn't there, Mr. Cohen? That was I think. Yeah, maybe Mr. Cohen designed the state but bank. Bill White. When I was reading on the courthouse, and the people worked on that, Bill White followed worked as a carpenter when they built the courthouse that here is here today. He showed me the wooden tools they made, the wooden handles that they had. the carpenters had whittled out and put on the metal that they had, but they were handmade tools and things to work with. But he was one of them that helped build the that's the kind of courthouse that the us today. Those are the interesting things that you read about in there of that time. Mm -hmm. The people with either their sons or somebody else may not bring memories back. Like I remember somebody talking about the uh, Donnellys made the big seal of the state of Indiana that sets over the head. Donnellys, I'm sure, did a lot of that stuff. The Donnellys, an old wedding bill, at one time it was a creamery. And that Austin Avenue was known as Buttermilk Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Question back there. Go ahead. Um, I worked with the city on the Centennial, and I received a phone call one day from a lady from Wheatfield that said, as a little girl, and this lady told me she was probably 85 years old, and that as a little girl, she'd go in the courthouse, and when she walked in on the basement floor, there was a mayor that had, that when you would stand in front of it, would be like when you go to the circus. Does anybody know where that's from? I told her if I could ever find out, I'd let her know where the mirror came from, why it was there, whatever happened to it. Do you remember it? Right. Uh huh. I, since I've been in Slayer, I've always heard a rumor that one of the first department stores in Men's Slayer was founded by one of the Leopolds that pushed a wheelbarrow full of, gro of ladies' dresses all the way from Fowler to Men's Slayer down the dirt road. <laughs> got the Men's Slayer to open up the department store. <laughs> <laughs> there was a young man who was handicapped, and he had a little scooter that he went on, had two little handles. My father had that little scooter after he died and bought it for sale. It was burned, the, hot, the box burned. So I think he had that little scooter. He heard it well, any other questions for the, uh, for the experts on men's affairs? <laughs> okay, well, gentlemen, we thank you very much, and we thank the audience. And Judy, take it away. Have any announcements? Just that we'll see you at the core building next week and you'll